Well, hello, everyone. Hope everyone can hear me well. Um, hi, uh, my name is Daniel. I uh, work on uh, Pioneer along with a couple of other uh, brave people today that are setting up uh, what is hopefully going to be a, a couple of you know interesting minutes, maybe an hour or two of internet content for you. We have a lot of interesting things coming up for you today. Um, before I give you just a quick overview of what's going to happen, I do want to tell you very quickly what the heck Pioneer is, if you're not sure. It is uh, effectively a uh, online uh, startup uh, accelerator, maybe even an online startup generator. Uh, and what I mean by that is we take people from around the world who are working on projects, you know, people who aren't quite sure if what they have is uh, just, you know, a, you know, a weekend idea or a real company. Uh, and then we help them kind of take it a step forward, get a little bit of validation, more importantly, kind of meet an, an, uh, a like-minded set of community of people, funding, uh, you know, guidance, the, the whole gamut. Um, Pioneer is fully remote. You can get started from anywhere where you are on in the world. And really what we're trying to do is bring uh, the magic uh, that makes Silicon Valley work, the dynamism that makes California the land of the Kind of economic frontier for the past you know 50 or 60 years certainly the technological one and and kind of bleed that into the internet we want everyone to experience what it's like you know to be you know wander the streets of palo alto um or san francisco or london and so pioneer is really an attempt to kind of rebuild that sense of presence that sense of place a city almost on the internet of people kind of working on interesting projects that may turn into you know the next uh great set of companies the next stripes airbnbs figmas and what have you um so check it out um all that being said, we're going to have um, an interesting mix of content for you today. Um, we are going to show you some of the uh, companies uh, uh, founded uh, here at Pioneer. Um, they'll be interviewed by a bunch of uh, uh, different founders uh, as their hosts. Uh, and so we have Austin Allred, who's the founder of a company called Lambda School um, that I think many of you have, have seen probably on um on the bits over in the internet, uh, Sean McGuire, uh, who uh, founded multiple companies as an elite marathoner, um, now a partner at Sequoia, uh, and Des uh, Trainer, the founder of Intercom. Um, we'll be interviewing a bunch of different founders from around the world, from Iran to Ireland, um, about the companies that they're building. Um, we are also going to have two interesting interviews to kind of mix it up throughout the day. Um, one with Dylan Field, the founder of Figma, who is going to pitch Figma to us as if it was a seed company. This should be quite inspiring and, and interesting to watch. Um, the uh, second interesting thing we're going to do is we're going to have a quick uh, kind of lightning round fireside chat conversation and interview with Sam Teller, who until very recently was Elon's chief of staff. Uh, I think that stands to be uh, quite uh, uh, intriguing and exciting. Anyway, so that's the overview of what we're going to do today. Uh, I think it should be a lot of fun. We're going to try to keep it lively and interesting. As we all know, um, uh, there's a lot going on in the world right now. And um, we think uh, hopefully Pioneer can be, uh, you know, an inspiring, consistent, durable source of optimism and inspiration for people uh, while we kind of uh, wade through the sea of uncertainty uh, and handle this um, cosmic hairball of a year. Um, all of that being said, um, I'd like to hand it over to Jackson now from Pioneer, um, who is going to uh, walk us through some of the details of the format today. Jackson, take it away. Uh, it is fairly simple for everybody watching. You have three options. You'll see that you can chat with any of our Pioneers before, during, and after their presentation. You can also follow any of the Pioneers. And what that'll do is we will uh, facilitate an exchange of emails afterward uh, to, to keep you connected. The last feature of the live stream today is points. Everyone watching has 200 points to distribute at their discretion to their favorite presentations as we go along. And at the end, we will announce our winner, our top, our, our, our top three winners, our, our crowd favorites. With that, I think we can get right into it and bring Austin Allred, the CEO, uh, and founder of Lambda School up to this stage. Hello, hello. Austin, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Fantastic, thanks for being here. Yeah. And our, uh, our pioneers, first pioneers, first pioneers up are gonna be the team uh, Rant from USA and Canada. We have Ansh, Rishab, and Sam. Go ahead, guys. Hi, so we're building Rant, disappearing voice charts. Audio is the future of communication and texting was never supposed to be the way we communicated with the people we love as it's impersonal and disregards emotion. And voice has been overlooked as a communication medium and incumbents focus on synchronous communication, making it more inconvenient than it should be. Now is the perfect time for voice as listening has become more popular than ever. WeChat users sent 6.1 billion voice chats, uh, voice chats each day, and Clubhouse raised at a $100 million valuation with little to no traction. 
Rant is a solution, which lets users exchange disappearing voice chats, providing the benefits of calling with the convenience of texting. What makes us different is that we let users exchange disappearing voices, which lets conversations flow how they do naturally without the fear of permanency. Also, we're a voice only platform, which means our users have sent more voice messages on Rant than all previous communication apps. Also, we're asynchronous, which means that users don't have to be on the call at the same time and can have conversations at their convenience. So we've launched our public beta eight days ago. And in these eight days, we've amassed over 250 users, had over 13,000 voice chats sent and received on our platform, enabling over a thousand connections to be made. Along with organic growth through friend invites, uh, we've gotten over 12 influencers with uh, combined 5 million impressions lined up uh, to better engage our fans. Uh, their fans. So we also have over 10 college ambassadors ready to spread the word. So our team has vast experience in this space with over a thousand user interviews conducted at previous consumer facing startups, individually built apps with over 300,000 users and prior work at Apple developing new features on the Siri team. Let's go. So scan this QR code to get rant now. Uh, we are raising a pre-seed. So reach out to founder at tryrant.co to learn more. Thank you so much. So Austin, what do you think this is? So, yeah, I think that is like, I, I get the disappearing voice chat. What I'm not totally sure of is, is it channel based? Is it more WhatsApp or more Twitter? If that makes sense. Like, right, am so I it sending it in a one-on-one -on -one conversation to a friend or am I sending it out into the ether for people to listen to for a short period of time? How's, how are the connections made? So uh, connections are made by just adding friends. We've kept it open right now because we allow for Ask Me Anything for incoming freshmen. That's our uh, initial growth sport channel. Uh, so it's more like um, Snapchat than uh, Twitter. So I can, I can send a broad, I, I guess I'm asking, is it broadcast, is it group, or is it one-to-one? One-to-one. One-to-one. Okay. Now. Yeah, so, I mean, my first impression is that Apps like this are super, super valuable, but the difficult thing is getting adoption on both sides, right? So if I want to send a, send a message to Daniel, Daniel has to have the app and I have to have the app, um, which is, can be both a really good and a really bad thing, right? Uh, really good because then if I want to use it, I force Daniel to download it really bad because if I have it alone, it, it isn't really helpful. So how do you how do you solve that chicken and egg problem? Right. So a little bit about that. Um, so we are creating uh, network effects within communities, um, a lot within college communities where you know they both get something out of it. But also uh, we're working with influencers and their fans reach out to them and they want to both like on the influencer side they want to reach out to their fans and connect with them more. And on the fan side they want to get to know the influencer themselves. And in addition to that, we've also identified some certain niches like Ask Me Anything for incoming freshmen. So we partner, partnered up with juniors and seniors of different colleges to conduct Ask Me Anything on our platform. And this is scheduled in the next two weeks. Tell me more about that. How does it, how does it Ask Me Anything work if it's a messaging app effectively? Exactly. So uh, we are open right now. So it's an open invite. So you can just add anyone. So uh, these people post stories uh, on other platforms like Snapchat or Instagram uh, saying that, uh, like, you can just ask me all the questions here. So people can basically add them and they can go through it really, really fast, like answer each question one on one really fast and move through the order. What, what have you had the most traction around? What have people been most excited about? So the entire sort of focus has been on reducing the friction of voice. So it's as easy as texting, which, which we do through disappearing voice chat. So uh, think of it like this, right? Instead of a text, uh, instead of the keyboard, you only have one button. And if you send a voice, you always receive a voice, which reduces the friction, which is why people are using it for normal conversations now, our primary users, which is why we've, have, we've had over 13,000 voice messages sent uh, and received uh, in such a short time. So if you're a profile, your average user, is it, you know, me just sending random chats to my friend or like, um, Hey, random question, Austin. Um, so obviously there's a chicken and egg problem, right? Lots of chicken and egg problems, delicious. Um, but, um, one, and obviously one way people have fixed these problems in other social networks is they pick a niche community to seed in, you know, famous quotes from Mark Zuckerberg in what was it? 2005 Harvard, Facebook should never expand beyond Harvard. That's where it got big. And, you know, everyone as a, as a result tests colleges first. Um, 
should they try like should they try to just grow in a small micro community and if so would lambda school students perhaps be an interesting place to experiment yeah so i think the interesting the interesting thing to me is that what you are saying is hey it's a one to one you know easy way to make chat simple um but then your first use case of an ama feels like actually a really interesting application of not exact, like it feels like you're kind of hacking your own app to enable that, right? Uh, which is always fascinating to me. So I'm curious, is that is that hack because that seems like a good user acquisition hack or is that because that seems to be how people want to use it and the product isn't built that way yet? So a little so bit of both. Yeah, yeah. so it, it, it is a good way to get users um, introduced to us in our platform. Um, but also, um, yeah, we are we are looking to um, so expand in, in different ways, yeah. <laughs> uh, gotcha, no, 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 it's you're deep in thought. Um, okay, sadly, um, I think we are, wow, there's, you have a giant Gaussian blur, Gaussian blur on your, uh, your so camera, it, your lens. I don't know what this camera is, but I have to open this camera settings app and then it resets, so. Today we learned that Austin is secretly at a CNN studio. Anyway, um, guys, this has been great. I think we're sadly out of time, um, and I'm going to let uh, Jackson transfer us uh, to the next episode. Good luck, Grant, guys. Thank you, Austin. Next up, we have Cameron Vaughn from Canada. Uh, sorry, from San, uh, from California, and he will be presenting Forge. Canada, California, they're all the same these days. As we hook them up, you know, it's interesting, Austin. One quick thought, you know, walkie-talkies exist. So that's kind of just an interesting old school analogy to rant. All right, Forge, let's do it. All right. Hello, Austin. Hello, everyone. My name is Cameron, and I am building Forge, which is a language school in your pocket. I'm an avid language learner myself. I've studied four languages, including minoring in Japanese at Stanford. And I found this consistent problem, uh, and I'm not the only one, which is that that the content and tools that are out there are incredibly disconnected and siloed. Essentially everything you need exists out there on the internet to learn a new language, but it's not all connected together and brought into one system. So that's what we're doing. When you open up Forge, we start you on a fundamentals course. We have really in-depth explanations, these kind of long reading lessons uh, and which we have way more content than anyone else has at all, um, a full textbook basically. Then we combine that with interactive exercises to really lock things in. But that's just the start. We, uh, we then move on to loading that content automatically into dynamic review tools. So we can provide you with tools to, to review concepts and vocab like the example is here in a space repetition system with multiple question types and multimedia. We should address the, uh, the green owl in the room, um, which is the most common question I get when talking about Forge, which is what about Duolingo? Um, Duolingo is fun, no doubt. I've used it extensively myself, um, but it does not teach you a language in the way you're expecting, right? Duolingo trains you for Duolingo. You get better, you become a master of multiple choice and you get good at Duolingo, then you go try and talk to someone and you cannot understand them. So that's what we're building is, is uh, basically a Duolingo that actually prepares you for the real world, right? We're bringing together all the content you could need, combining it with those dynamic review tools and, uh, and, and packaging it up into that smooth UI. Um, Forge is a school, it just doesn't feel like school. Right now, we have around 1800 downloads across iOS and Android. Our users are completing seven to eight lessons every day. Um, and we've doubled our monthly retention since our last update about six weeks ago. Uh, what you're seeing there is essentially brand new. So if you're interested, uh, you can download Forge at forge.co, find links for both Android and iOS. And we are raising right now, so you can contact me at Cameron at forge.co. Awesome, super interesting. Um, so it's always like, it's fascinating to me when there is a company that's in a market that's so dominated by one player that you actually have like, and that was the thing going through my mind. It's like, oh, it's like Duolingo, but somehow different. Yes. Um, <laughs> so what do you think it is? I think, I think this is perhaps the most important question to ponder on. What is it that makes Duolingo so successful? Why has Duolingo dominated the market? Yeah, that's a great question. It's, um, it is definitely the has the largest both market share and mind share of any of any app out there. 
Um, and it's, it's mainly because it's incredibly addicting and that uh, they built this just, they've done really well at building that game out where you, mm -hmm. you just want to come back every day. I talked to a user who had a thousand day streak. So she'd been doing this every day for three years and just like could not let it go, even though she acknowledged that it wasn't the best way to learn, right? So um, that is the, I think the biggest challenge for us is, is you know, getting people off of that and onto, onto here. Although to be fair, they do have a lot of churn. So um, people are looking for something more robust. Sure, so your, your core thesis is, if I, to put words in your mouth, Duolingo built a really addictive game engine and the effectiveness of that engine, eh, like doesn't really matter because Duolingo is not like getting paid to actually teach you a language. It's getting paid for you to like keep using the app. Right, their tagline is we make learning free and fun. And my question has always been, well, what about effective and- What about the learning right? piece? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what do you do? So that kind of gets the next core piece of your thesis. What are you doing that's different? I mean, obviously I've spent a ton of time looking at different pedagogical methodologies. Yeah. Uh, what, what's your core thesis there for what Ling, Duolingo, I mean, not who cares about Duolingo for the right way for people to learn and sure. stay engaged? Yeah. So Cameron, as you think about answering Austin, if you could just hit that camera lens again, that'd be great. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so um, that's a great question. We uh, it is from just like taking tech out of it. The the actual approach is completely different. They they have kind of this uh, bottom up approach of throwing you into different lessons and different like saying, hey, translate this and figure out the grammar and things on your on your own. So we flipped it completely and said, hey, no, we like textbooks. We like classes where they actually teach you the concepts, right? Um, I liked my class, my Japanese classes in college. And so we're making our feature set is much more comparative to a university classroom than it is to Rosetta Stone or something like that. So sure. actually introducing you, it, the UI is very similar and approachable that way, but what's going on behind the scenes is completely different. The, there's like tons of content and really robust, a whole library of stuff behind. Yeah, so you're just saying, hey, let's just take a fundamental classroom experience of learning a language and put it into an app as opposed to this cute little quirky game thing that doesn't really work. Exactly. I see new apps okay. every day that say you're learning a language wrong. Uh, here's a brand new way to learn. And I think, you know, many thousands of years of humans learning language can't be completely wrong. There's no brand new ways, right? So let's take that and apply what we can from technology to it. I think you just asked my next question is, which is how do you stand out in that flooded of a market when there are that many apps? Yeah, how do you gain traction? That's been the challenge. Um, fortunately, most of our users have come from places like the different Reddit language learning communities. So I get kind of, uh, you know, direct feedback from them and, um, both the the you know methodology of providing really robust resources for them um, and kind of the the general vision of connecting up these different pieces i think we'll you know you saw that we have quite a different uh experience right now but it will continue to build on that um, as we get more content and things but the the essentially marketing challenge and even getting people on in that crowded of a space is, is definitely the biggest challenge for us. Last question. I know we're out of time. So I saw Spanish. Um, yeah. I assume basically every language learning app has Spanish. Yeah. Are there, uh, do you speak Spanish? Yeah. Okay. Are there any, I, I think a really interesting user acquisition hack. Are there any quasi esoteric languages that aren't covered well by language learning apps? For example, I speak Russian. There are not very many good Russian yeah. learning apps. That the market size is obviously smaller, but anyway, I think that could yeah, be no, interesting. I started studying Swedish Wedge. and it's the same yeah. there where there's just nothing, nothing for ASL, for example, things like that. So um, yeah. And I think it, the flip side is going from Spanish to English will actually be bigger in the long run than going English to Spanish. That's just what we've started with to kind of build up the tech. One thing that I think could be interesting as we as we move on, uh, just a thought that's occurring is um, I, I, uh, one use case that, uh, that I think Duolingo seems to have captured well is couples. You're dating someone, you're married to someone who speaks another language, you want yeah. to know. So I wonder if that's an interesting uh, vector to grow. That's in. where we get to the level two kind of things where it gets in a more topic based and we can go to those specific vectors of, hey, you're in a couple, hey, you're uh, doing business, you're a pilot, whatever that is, and go specific to, to your needs.
Well, thank you. This is awesome. Well, uh, Jackson, thank you, awesome. I see you've switched your microphone technology. Tell us what's next. Indeed, I have. Um, next up, thank you, Cameron. Next up, we have uh, our final pioneer with Austin is going to be Tom McCarthy from Ireland. Okay. And he'll be presenting Patch. And um, is... as Tom gets set up. Uh, Working on it. Yep. <laughs> there we go. We got to get your camera some glasses, Austin. It's Logitech. Like, you'd think they'd have this figured out by now. I don't know. Well, it's, like, it's all of that uh, Chinese uh, bootloaders. You know, they take up space. And all they right. buy it from Amazon. Exactly. You know, Tom. All right. Hey, Daniel. Hey, Austin. Hey, everybody. Um, so I'm Tom. I'm a physics student in Trinity College, Dublin, and I'm building Patch. So Patch finds and accelerates great young builders. We bring together high potential young people and immerse them in an environment that helps them fulfill that potential. We're focused on exploring, learning, and uh, building, learning by doing, I meant to say. And um, so you're probably asking, is it a startup accelerator? No, it's a people accelerator. Now, let me show you one of last year's participants, Diana. She's an award-winning young biochemist, and she'll tell you a bit more about why Patch is needed. And um, there's no one place, I think, in Ireland where you can meet a group of people with cool backgrounds, cool stories, cool projects coming up and just fascinating lives and being able to talk with them and like connect with them and see what they're like. And I think Patch has done that. So we bring together extraordinary young people like Diana and we give them a space where they can build together and create. Now, the idea is that Patch is a local search network that brings together such young people so that they can later go on to global success through the likes of Pioneer. Last summer, we ran our pilot program. It took place in Dogpatch Labs. That's a startup hub in Dublin. Now, we had 12 participants take part. Uh, they had previously worked on quantum computing algorithms. Diana had done biochemistry research. And some of them, they had just done a lot of hacking. Um, and they spent six weeks building projects together. They ranged from uh, an internet-first textbook to a 3D printing tool for kids' Minecraft creations. And CropSafe, incidentally, a startup that's now top of the global pioneer leaderboard. Um, teams were also paired with expert mentors, and they learned from inspiring role models who gave talks and, and workshops. This includes Des Trainer of Intercom and other founders of businesses worth billions of dollars. Now, this summer we're running, we're running an expanded and refined summer accelerator. It's Patch 2020. It's remote first due to the pandemic, and uh, we've got an amazing lead mentor. Uh, he's a startup founder whose, whose company was previously acquired by Facebook. We'll continue to grow Patch, and in the future, we'll expand into more initiatives like, uh, say, curated work experience programs. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is to create the most effective environment for high potential young people to realize that potential. Potential as builders of the future. Now, if you know someone, a teenager who should take part, get in touch, or if you'd like to support us anyway, I'd love to hear from you. Thanks very much. First of all, I'm super jealous of all, all you youngins who get to do stuff like this. I had to, I mean, me and Daniel had to like, hang out on random message boards and try to find like-minded people. So uh, really, really cool. What age groups are you targeting? Uh, so we're focused on 16 to 19 year olds, um, a little bit lenient. So if someone's a great fit and they're like a year within or out of that, you know, we're open, but 16 to now, how, do, how do people find out about you? Uh, so as I mentioned, very locally search network, but kind of three pronged approach. Recruiting is open now. So applications are open for the next two weeks, but one is really high signal is referrals from previous participants. Um, so people that took part last the co last year's cohort, uh, we're going out through all them. They, they're, they're very, people who took part are really good at recognizing who's a good fit for the program for most extent. Uh, second of all, we reach out through existing organizations. So things like not national science fairs, like say the BT Young Scientist, uh, which Patrick Collison won when he was a teenager and other initiatives that are really well networked in Ireland already. And then also we're doing a bit of media outreach um, and that, that's, that's going live this week around the country. How does uh, select, how do, what, what is the application process like and how do you determine whether somebody ought to be a part of it? Right, so the application process this year is uh, two, two stages. Uh, we start off just text applications and they're the ones that are open for the next two weeks. And after that, we, uh, we shortlist and we do quick, short video interviews with everybody. Now, what the text application is looking to do is, uh, like, to give you a sense of the profile, what we're looking for is, as I mentioned, high potential young people. But what does that entail? It's kind of, it's hard enough to recognize. And I guess that's what we're trying to get better and better at as we go on. Um, I guess you have some experience with that at Lambda as well, right? But we're looking for people who are proactive, who, who, who teach themselves and can sort of show a very, a very, High speed trajectory in, in in learning by doing and applying themselves. So in the in the application form with the text, we ask them about kind of what projects have you done, what are your skills that you've developed, and also just sort of looking for sort of quirky out of the box stuff 
things, signs that they take initiative, things like, you know, just what's a, I guess like the, say the Y Combinator program the question or Sam Altman question where what's, what's some, something you act or sometimes you broke a rule and that sort of stuff. You know, Austin, you bring up an, an interesting question about the message boards. Part of what was interesting about the early internet is um, it was less populous and to be online, you had to be somewhat weird. So free selection was already happening already by the fact that, you know, you went on news groups. It was nerds by virtue of you being on the internet at all. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And obviously today everything's easier. So, so it, it is an interesting question. I think that you bring up, you know, now that access to the web is, you know, significantly more ubiquitous selection becomes a little bit more difficult. So I guess the question I would ask you, Austin, given what you do with Lambda school and given the fact that many Lambda school students, as far as I can tell, are incredibly conscientious and motivated, what are kind of interesting gauntlets, um, creative ways, you know, there's kind of obvious stuff, various tests and whatever, what are kind of interesting ways where if you were starting from scratch now, where you could kind of put Hogwarts at the top of the mountain, such that the only people that ascend to the top, um, you know, are, are people with good legs, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, so what we select for is probably a little bit different than what you may select for um, because we're, we're, you know, we're optimizing for, will you get a job? And that's all I really care about. You're optimizing for, are you smart and are you interesting and are you interested? Right. Um, and I think that's like, I mean, one of the reasons I say I'm jealous is like, I had no, ex you know, there, there wasn't a really good way for people like me and Daniel Gross. I think Daniel's actually a little young, younger than I am. Like, unless we stumbled upon some Not random, what was that? Not in spirit. Go ahead. <laughs> You know, I guess I guess what I'm trying to claw at is what is the equivalent of what is the equivalent scene basically that the internet itself was in 2002. Right. How does the hurdle become nerdy enough that only I, nerdy is the maybe the wrong term, but like you're you're trying to select for a type of person who is you're, you're trying you're trying to put in a filter, right? So where people sort right. of the virtue of doing being part of whatever niche group or, or, or doing whatever activity. What is that thing? Like what we do is by, by sections, we go out through uh, groups like the Coder Dojo and the science fairs. And I think that's a selection filter in a way. I don't know if it's as specific as the early internet is yet, but that's kind I of think what we're Science fair is actually a pretty good filter because that's, that's not something everybody does, right? Um, you, you have to be, you have to be sufficiently nerdy to like, enter into high levels of science fairs, I think. The other thing that I think is fascinating is if there's a way to just filter for some combination of intelligence and drive generally, um, like getting all the smart, motivated people in the same room is super, super powerful. Um, like long, ter long term, we could create like a, a, a widespread like screen for just smart, motivated people based on some general test. Maybe that's a holy grail. I do think, um, and, and um, uh, I'm sorry, we're going to have to advance to the next one, but I do think, by the way, on that front, something to fun to think about, Tom, and uh, is not the test. So the test is the obvious way of doing this, um, you know, some type of way of truly assessing it, uh, someone's conscientiousness or intellect. The more interesting thing is what are free tests? Like, I, I guarantee you, uh, anyone writing Lisp, it, you've, yeah. you've already selected yourself into the fact that you're weird, introverted, probably are a hacker and, you know, probably are into, I don't know, aesthetically pleasing programming languages. That says a lot about you. Anyway, food people have organically, organically filtered themselves into groups by doing stuff like that is super interesting. Yeah. Hey, thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you very much, Austin. Um, this is great. I'm glad we got a chance to demo the best of Logitech's technology with you. Plus, uh, 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 your energy and enthusiasm, enthusiasm was great. Um, this Jackson, webinar is sponsored by Logitech. Exactly, exactly. I'm certainly sponsored by Nike. Um, so thank you again. Um, Jackson, uh, who's up next? Our, our next host is Sean McGuire. Sean is a partner at Sequoia. Um, also founder should really of be. Oh my God, he's also sponsored by Nike. That's there what I was going to say, Daniel. That's, I, I changed the view so you could see that, that I'm wearing the same shirt as you. Well, you're a real athlete. I'm just joking around here, but um, we can talk about that afterwards. Um, all right, Sean, uh, you'll be, I don't know where he, where his face is. Arsalan, are you there? Yep. 
Okay, you're um, Arsalan, take it away. Uh, so hi everybody, uh, I'm Arsalan. I'm a mechanical engineer from Kashmir and I'm currently in San Francisco. I'm building LiveDocs. LiveDocs is the modern day office suite. Uh, with LiveDocs, teams can save time and money by automating the repetitive and mundane task of updating documents. So let's dive straight into it and show you what it looks like. Uh, what you're seeing here, besides the rich collaborative editor, is a completely programmable document. This here is an example of a daily business report that updates itself with data from tools like Salesforce, Stripe, Amplitude, QuickBooks. It also integrates with on-prem software and your own internal API, of course. Uh, you can then set up triggers and actions to manipulate this document. You can do everything from configuring simple alerts and approvals all the way to automating complex multi-stage processes. And, and this when your document a, needs- uh, You know, a crazy uh, mock that you made in Figma, right? This is real software, is that correct? Yes. Okay, just clarifying. Uh, when your document needs uh, data from other sources and services, LiveLocks lets you sign into those services and makes all your data points, tables, and visualizations available to you and your team to use in your documents. Use LiveDocs, for example, to automatically update the weekly or daily sales report with information entered by a sales team in Salesforce and then build a quick automation to update the Monday, uh, weekly sales report and send it out at every Monday at 9 a.m. Boom, problem solved. And the reason we're excited about this is that companies all the way from Fortune 500s to two-person startups run on documents. Yet nobody really likes driving ownership of the documents. And we can see why, because that usually involves pasting in numbers, putting in screenshots, and dealing with subsequent typos, and the please fix thanks, and navigating the in entire maze of permissions and account passwords to do so. Uh, sales teams, for example, spend only 34% of their time actually doing sales. Product spec, as any product manager will tell you, is an endless nightmare of nagging stakeholders to update the spec, adding customer feedback, wherever relevant, only to have that out of date uh, screenshot still staring at you. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's hundreds, if not thousands of types of documents that can be automated. The reality of the situation is that modern workflows have evolved way beyond this. And most teams data is already online, siloed across dozens of tools. And uh, with LiveDocs, our goal is to save millions of hours of productivity lost every year to manually updating document and sluggish document workflows. So if you want to take uh, LiveDocs for a spin or to provide feedback, head over to livedocs.com. First of all, Sean, um, I hope you were listening because I'm going to ask you, what do you think LiveDocs is? I mean, I think LiveDocs is a programmable you know, document editor, collaborative document editor, some, somewhere between Google Sheets and Notion, but more programmable, better API integrations. I mean, that's like my quick distillation, but I have a bunch more to say. How, yeah. How'd I do? What do you think? Yeah, I think I think you did thirteen out of ten. Would ask you again. So, <laughs> but Arsalan's really the real judge. He'll email you his score later. What are some interesting questions you have for Arsalan about the business? What, yeah. How would you think about go to market? How? What do you feel like you've learned by looking at other? Companies? I mean, go ahead. It, it's a it's a really great idea, um, and I mean, I'm I'm impressed. I thought that was a Figma mock until Daniel asked the question. So that was a smart preemption. Look like very candidly. I co-founded a company and the CEO sends out once a week, a updated Google sheets with like all of our sales data. And, you know, there's like a team of four or five people that input engineering updates and all these different, you know, updates. And the Google doc is a, you know, there's like 50 weeks in the year. And by the end of the year, you have a hard time loading the document and anyways, it's just, it's not the right way to solve this problem. Document anarchy as a term yeah, you've coined anarchy. internally. Um, I, like, I very much think there is a need for improved documents. I mean, isn't it interesting, how Sean, just a quick question. How often do you get kind of investor updates uh, that include screenshots in them? Every All day. Uh, yeah. like it's, I think there's a, the challenge you have here is one of distribution where mm -hmm. like in the case of Expanse, because we- Expanse is the company you co-founded, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So in the case of like, you know, we use Google Suites, like products, you know, for Gmail in particular. And so then you basically get Google Docs as an yeah. add-on for free. Yeah. Uh, and it's hard to convince people to pay extra yeah. money, like to jump over when you have something that's good enough, even though it's super frustrating. It's hard to convince them to pay for something new. Notion seems to be doing pretty well with that. But just my biggest question is distribution. Like, what is the what is the motivation? Like, what is the ROI to convince people to, you know, pay for something extra beyond Google Sheets? 
Um, so that's a great question. So th let's break it down into two parts, I think. Uh, the first one is uh, the way we're approaching it is that our goal in the in the short term, medium term, long term is to basically seamlessly fit into your workflow as opposed to come in and ask you to replace your entire workflow tools. And we are working with uh, allowing you to import and export documents, not only from Google Docs, Microsoft Office, whatever, but also allowing you to have the actual live docs documents live inside your Google Drive so you can do permissions management and all that, that way. So the way we're really thinking about it is an evolution, a gradual evolution, as opposed to like coming and replace your entire workflow. So integrating with these tools that companies already use uh, has been the key priority from day one. The heading on the page has always been to go from reality to model as opposed to model to reality uh, and really capture these real world interactions that people have with software and figure out a way to figure out what their end goal is and find a better means to that end. That might be by uh, making it a plugin that lives inside of Google Docs even, but uh, and eventually switching them over to the Live Docs main editor, which is kind of in parallel with something that Grammarly did, where you can install a plugin that works with your existing workflow, but to access the full suite of powerful tools and you know emotional context behind text and whatnot, you have to switch over to that. That's the way we're thinking about it. I'm kind of curious to ask, you know, so obviously we have this interesting problem talking about distribution in the enterprise. There's basically two ways to play the game. Obviously, one is reduce friction and Arsalan's flagging here, you know, extensions, whatever the other is to increase value. And maybe that's what kind of Notion does over time. The trick is, of course, in products where it, the value is kind of CAGR, it grows over time. You have to educate someone on how to use it. So kind of familiar topic. Now, I'm curious, um, uh, Sean, when you guys were starting Expanse, I mean, as I understand it, many of the customers are huge companies, huge enterprises, governments, whatever. Um, uh, how did you guys do early sales? Obviously, later on, the flywheel compounds, people know what Expanse is, but how did you do it in the early days? How did you get your first big contract or two? Great question. So it was three steps. The first step is we essentially got paid to be consultants to do more or less like product development for other people to solve their problems. Second step, once after we'd done that for a while, is we literally started selling PDF reports. We had built this tool that can like figure out what companies' networks are, and we would sell PDFs for fifty thousand dollars a piece. That would kind of be your moment in time cybersecurity presence. Um, That's great. And then the third level is like building the full enterprise deployment that can kind of plug directly into Splunk or whatever like security platform is running your business. And for that third level, I mean, it was doing full enterprise sales like that is incredibly hard. I do not recommend top down sales on my worst enemy. Um, bottoms up is a much easier way to go. But in that case, like, you know, it's building a relationship with someone over the course of a year. Something that I think is really underrated is just doing lots of favors for people. Um, like in that year long process of while you're building trust, like, you know, if you think of something of how you can be helpful to them, just offer it for free. And I think that's oftentimes what it takes to get to these full enterprise deployments. Uh, but so anyways, for us, it was those three things. And the intermediate one was try and provide moment in time value, like one-off value and charge what people would be willing to pay for it. And Daniel, these are the biggest companies in the world. And so they'd be willing to pay a lot for the moment in time value. Um, but I, like for you, Arslan, I think there's opportunity to have bottoms up adoption and that's much better. Yes, we, are, right, so we are approaching it from a bottom up perspective. But thank you so much. Going bottoms that. up, guys. That's right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Arsalan. Uh, out of time, we've got to move on. Uh, Jackson, direct us. Yes, next up we have Alex Shevchenko. Uh, he is presenting from Canada and will be showing us SafeWatch. Hey, everyone. I'm Alex Shevchenko from Montreal, Canada and I'm presenting SafeWatch an application that connects to your existing security cameras and gives them superpowers through object detection and more. So traditional security cameras have a feature for motion detection alerts, but if you ask anyone who has ever used them, they'll tell you that they kind of suck. They're unreliable, send alerts way too often, and don't tell you what's happening because they don't know what's happening. They only see motion and not actual objects. That's where SafeWatch comes in. With SafeWatch, you can connect to your existing security camera without any additional hardware, and create detectors for things that you care about. So if you create a person detector and a person appears in your backyard like a thief, you'll receive a notification saying that there's a person and not like with motion alerts cameras that tell you when a squirrel runs through your backyard or a leaf falls from a tree. But if you have a more complex use case, 
For example, you let your dog run around your backyard and he keeps trampling and destroying your flowers. With SafeWatch, you could draw a bounding box around your flowers, create a dog detector, and when your dog gets near them, you'll be notified. But why get notified about a problem instead of fixing it? You could also integrate SafeWatch with if this then that in a smart sprinkler. And when your dog gets near your flowers, activate the sprinkler automatically, get the dog wet and away from your flowers. So SafeWatch integrates with Zapier, if this then that. And if that's not enough, you could even build your own application around SafeWatch through webhooks. So if you have security cameras at home or even at work, head on to usesafewatch.com to connect your cameras and try it out today. And if you have any questions, you can reach me at alex at usesafewatch.com. Awesome. Thank you for that, Alex. Um, last, then it's also a great idea. You know, Sequoia is a small investor in a company called Vercata, which I think has some of the similar kind of I, capturing a similar idea, but they're vertically integrated. They've decided to actually like build the cameras themselves and try to sell to office buildings and college campuses, et cetera. Uh, but also to go all the way from the actual cameras up to providing some of the software on top. And this is a really interesting approach of like just taking the raw video feed and outputting the insights. Two, my two biggest questions are one, a lot of times like people have trouble actually extracting the insights from like the product or from the data. If someone's very technical, I can, they're going to figure out how to use this, but I, I can just, it feels like the average consumer would have a hard time getting all the way to insights from this. Um, how, like, how do you think about that? Like, who's your target user? Is it the average, you know, parent watching their child, you know, and, and integrating with like a Nest Cam? Or is it like companies? Like, how do you think about who's going to use this? Yeah, for now, um, we're targeting basically people who do home automation. So like the people who like browse Reddit home automation and have like these super giant like workflows of things in their houses. So that's our first demographic. And then, yeah, right now it is kind of, kind of hard to, to, to access that insight and, and make those workflows. If you don't know, like if you're not super technical, that's why in the future we're planning to build like kind of like these pre-built packs of workflows. Like I'm a pet owner. Here are some things that you can do automatically. I'm, uh, I have a baby at home. I, like here's a pre-built pack for you, but like right now we don't have them available, but that's something that we'll, we will be adding in the future. That's smart. And how do you, can you get it? Like, you know, what is the underlying hardware where this is designed for at least in the beginning? Like, is it optimized for nest cams? Is it optimized for like the Nanit baby monitors? Is it, is it like optimized for legacy video products? Yeah. So we basically can connect to any, uh, yeah, classic cameras that support the UnVIF format, which is like most traditional kind of open cameras like HIK Vision, D-Link and things like that, that offer that, that format, we can integrate with basically any of them. And as long as you have like above standard resolution, you should be fine with using this. Got it. I think Daniel said that was the last question. I would just say really good idea. Um, I, I like how you're starting with Reddit home automation as like a savvy group of people that really care about this problem. And that's like a great first kind of user persona to target. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Sean. Perfecto. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Alex. We have one more for you, Sean. We have Sam Abrika from the UK. He'll be presenting Cash Coach. Hi, everyone. I will start by sharing three facts that you probably know. Millennials are the worst at financial planning and software didn't solve this problem. Nothing addressed their spending behavior. However, we know that gamification changes people's behavior. So we are bringing the power of gamification into the world of personal finance and create a gamified universe where people can compete at saving. The goal is to save as much as possible from your real life income to level up your in-game avatar. And Cash Coach is the character which gives a monthly saving challenges, tracks your progress, and keeps you motivated on a daily basis. All your spending behavior will be reflected through your avatar. The experience bar reflects the amount of 
income saved. There's a poison bar showing the credit card debt. And your avatar can progress up to level five. We launched that one month ago in the UK and our core users are very active. They're competing in their solo challenges. And now we are developing the multiplayer mode so that they can compete with their friends. And if they can't be their friends, then they can hire a cash coach for $6.99 a month. And it will tell them all the actions they need to take to, to win. And for all users, cash coach will monitor all the bills and try to find a cheaper deal. We'll take a commission on each switch. I have two great co-founders. We all love gaming. Alex owns the tech, Angela does the illustration, while I take care of the game mechanics and the data science. So if you have money, you can invest in our crowdfunding. Here is the link. And if not, then I strongly encourage you to download the app right now. Thank you very much. So just first question, for someone to get going with this, like when they, you know, we think a lot about like the friction to get onboarded successfully. What is the process? Like if I download the app and I can do it later, you know, like to integrate my bank or, you know, what, what different my credit card, like, what do you need to do? How fast and easy is that? It's pretty quick. So you, you the process is you sign up as an anonymous user, you pick your avatar, your nickname, then we use open banking. It directly connects through uh, the APIs of your banks and credit cards. So today it's uh, only in the UK. In, in 30 seconds, you can be set up. And how will that work in other countries? Like, is there an equivalent thing to open banking to make it really fast and easy to get online? So open banking started in the UK. That's where it's the, the most advanced. It's coming to the rest of the European Union, uh, still a bit behind in terms of data quality. In the US, uh, all banks are now using web scrapping to, uh, to, to do the, all the, the aggregation. So there's a bit more friction. People need to input the, the, the passwords, but um, they are also developing their APIs. So it's gonna come to the US very soon. And in terms of the gamification, what, like, what do you wanna build next? It seems like you've built kind of these virtual, like you can level up your character. Do you wanna have physical rewards like cash rewards or prizes? Do you wanna, like, you know, what's the vision for how to gamify it even more? Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of game mechanics that we want to implement. Uh, the first one will be to, to have the personality traits. Um, so your avatars, for example, if you start to, to drink too much, to spend too much on drinking, it will look drunk. And your, all your behaviors will reflect your avatar through personality traits. And you can gain positive traits, you can gain negative traits, and they'll be updated on, on a weekly basis. Uh, then what we want to do is to have virtual cash coach coins. So for example, everything that you have saved in the real life, you have the equivalent in coins. And then you can spend, for example, you can buy your virtual suits or your fancy handbags with your coins. Uh, but if you spend and waste it all in real life, then it will destroy all your equipment. And just part of why I asked the question is with a lot of these types of products, people will oftentimes kind of get bored at some point and churn off. And so how do you think about like retaining your users and keeping this exciting for a very long period of time? Is it just that this becomes like the key place where they learn about their finances and manage their finances or, or do you have other ideas? So far we, we are pretty good on the retention and on the engage, engagement. Our users uh, use the, the app seven times a week and the industry average is, is 1.2. Uh, the long term will be to, uh, to, to give them challenges that is always motivating, motivating them. They always have a next step to, to reach. And everybody wants one day to, to own a house or have bigger like investment goals. So there, the sky is the limit. Dan, you pop back on. Do you have a question? No, I was just going to um, warn us that we're running low on time. So, so kind of Last question, uh, maybe Sean, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you this. So don't go, don't mute yourself quite yet. Um, mobile apps, getting distribution obviously is, um, is hard, you know, kind of given what you see here um, with cash coach, what would be your kind of initial go to market strategy? What would be the niche, the market that you would target? Yeah. I mean, I, I was going to ask Sam this cause I mean, there really is app fatigue in general. You just see it in like download rates of new apps. I Sam, maybe you tell us, what, what, who, who are you going to hit up early? Or how do you think about growth and, you know, like 
getting people to download the app in the first place? Um, our first users typically, they, um, they have their first jobs. They need to manage their money for the first time, pay the rent, the bills, etc. cetera. They, they are not necessarily completely prepared for that. And um, that's typically the, the people who really like uh, Cash Coach and, and, the, and the user experience. Then for, for the growth, uh, we want them to compete with their friends. We want them to, to be really proud when they save. And uh, if everybody can bring one, two friends to, to compete and becoming better, then it will be a self-reinforcing viral loop. So I think that will be um, our primary growth channel. I think the second growth channel will be through the, all the education that we, we have to do around financial education. And... Um, uh, we want to we want to create the Cash Academy, which would be a place that anybody can learn everything they want uh, about money for free, and and that would be very good for SEO and gener generating traffic. Super interesting. Um, sadly, I think we are out of time. Sam, thank you very much. Sean, thank you very thank much. You. Thank so you all. Sad we didn't get a chance to tell everyone your fastest marathon time. No, no, don't, don't worry. What's Talk that? I can't hear you. I, all right, uh, Jackson, I, move on. <laughs> All right, uh, our next host is Des Trainer. Des is the founder of Intercom and our, uh, our, our first pioneer with Des, uh, Karen Surfity from Argentina, and she will be presenting Palabra. Hello, Des. Hey, everyone, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. I decided to wear Nike as well because it seemed to be the thing to do. <laughs> awesome. All right, go ahead, Karen. Okay, hi, everyone. Hi, Des. Hi. Um, so I will be presenting Palabra, which is a segment I offer emails. Um, what we do is we help companies email users based on what they do. So let's say a new user sign up, uh, you want to send a welcome email, you can do this very easily with our app. Um, but you want to do more complex stuff, like I want to wait two days uh, and then send them some onboarding advice. I can do that too. Um, and these are all cards, so you can just move them around and change the sequence of emails uh, to make it fit your needs. And, and you don't even need to think about the sequence of emails. You can just pick one of our templates for the most um, use cases. For example, let's say a user searched for a product, but they didn't buy. You pick uh, one of these templates. And you don't even really need to write the emails. We have a lot of uh, emails written for you for basic stuff like welcoming users, um, offering them um, advice or asking for feedback. And you can, of course, edit all these emails um, before sending them to the users very easily. So why are we building this? Um, companies need to improve sales and retention, and they need to send better segmented messages to do it. Uh, and the problem is that the tools we use for email marketing today were created a long time ago, and sending these segmented messages is, is kind of hard. Um, and what's interesting is that companies already have a lot of data about their users in the platforms they use. Like, um, <clears throat> you can email all your, for example, paying customers. You just connect Stripe, and we, we know who your paying customers are. You don't need to, to fill a form to do it. So you can do very interesting stuff like emailing your paying customers who logged in last week who bought your product once, for example. We launched three weeks ago. We have 150 users. Um, we are growing 20% weekly. And the way customers find us is mostly through content and direct sales. This is me. I'm a software engineer. I've been working full-time on this project for the past two months. Um, and that's it. We are live on Product Hunt. So if people in the audience want to vote, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Cool. This is awesome. As a, as you'd guess, I actually know this space pretty well. Yeah. Um, uh, cause I think, yeah, way back when we, we sort of shipped the first version of, of products like this. Um, it's obviously over the last 10 years, this area has grown significantly. Where do you think your competitive angle will be against, I'll leave Intercom out of it, uh, but like let's say ConvertKit or, uh, or let's say um, customer.io? Yeah, um, I think um, the way we started uh, is by talking to a very specific group of users, which in our case is uh, non-technical people who use tools like Zapier and Airtable, tools like that. So we help them integrate very easily with the tools they use. Um, for these users, uh, tools like um, Customario is extremely expensive and it's very hard to use. So we help them with simple UX, better pricing, basically. 
And the simple UX comes from the idea of like, it's effectively no code, is that right? Or is there also a coded version if you want it or? You can integrate uh, directly with JavaScript and more complex stuff, gotcha. but you can do everything without code if you need to. That makes sense. Um, are, uh, if you're not using the coded version, I presume your, your triggers are restricted to what's surfaced by the connections you've put in, is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Um, for the customers who are using you, are they are they using drip or triggered emails for the first time, or are they switching from competitors? That, that's a good question. Um, I think most of the users that are using it today uh, were looking for something like this and couldn't find anything that suit their needs. So I would think that is the first time they're doing it. We have a, okay. a, some bigger customers who are moving from something else, but most people are doing it for the first time. Um. When you think about like uh, the let's say the future of email, for lack of a better word, do you anticipate uh, branching into like either like browser notifications or like using modern messaging tools, say like push or Slack or something like that as an alternative? Definitely. Um, I think uh, what's interesting is uh, trying to improve customer communication, uh, whatever customers mm -hmm. are. And we started with emails because it's uh, maybe a problem that people feel they have today, but uh, yeah. I think we definitely need to move to other spaces soon. Um, and uh, I presume I'm going to get out of time in a second, but um, uh, another area, I, I guess something we have bumped into and I've seen a lot of our competitors bump into is like, uh, as you scale email, you run into all sorts of interesting problems. One of which is like say trust and credibility and deliverability, deliverability yes. and sense that uh, people will use your tool to spam and they will use your tool in malicious and nefarious ways. Uh, are you, have you invested any, anything in that yet? Or is that kind of like the future's problem? Yeah. Um, I think um, our main tool against that today is that we only let you build like your list of customers based on people who made some event on some of your apps or somewhere else. You, you cannot import a list of contacts today. I think that's cool. like a good measure today, but in the future, yeah. Cool. cool. And then my very last question is, um, as, you, uh, as this grows, do you expect to stay at the, relatively speaking, like the bottom of the market, so like a large number of small users, or do you expect moving up market and having like closer to enterprise customers with, who will want like a, you know, Marketo integrations and all sorts of like, you know, attribution metrics and all that sort of stuff? Do you have an opinion on which you'll do? Um, yes, I would prefer to move into the enterprise world a little right. bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, this is really, really good. Congrats. Thank you so much. Next up, uh, our next pioneer is Ina. And Ina is presenting from Belarus, showing us Verbot. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Ina and um, I'm co-founder of Verbot. I will start with the fact that only 7% of companies can exactly name all the people having access to their servers. And server credentials are safely stored in files, emails, or Google Docs, or shared with unknown people so often that there should be a simple solution. So this is where about. Uh, imagine you are a server owner with several developers working for you. So to securely provide access to your server, you just need to sign up, create a company account, and add there your server information. Then you can invite your employees, your remote workers, or your freelancers. Uh, these people will be able to connect to your server through our platform as soon as you activate the sharing. It is also possible to make some restrictions on your server work because, uh, for example, you can set the working time or you can grant access only from a specific country or IP address. As you can see here, uh, you can activate or block any user in just one click. Verbot provides a single sign-on to unlimited number of servers so that developers can forget about different passwords, keys, and settings. And also companies and server owners can not only share the success, but also can control the work performed on server with log records and screencasts of every server session. Our product can work as SaaS model or also can be installed on company servers on-premise. We started to work on it in September 2018, and last summer we present our MVP. And now there are 22 pilots from different software development companies using Verbot. And finally, meet our amazing team, having many years of experience in DevOps development and cybersecurity. Join us today and increase the security of your data.
Thanks. Very interesting. You, your second and last slide answered what was going to be my first question, which was some version of who still uses servers today. Uh, but uh, but I think like obviously banks, financial services, are, is your target market potentially uh, quite specific in a good way, as in it's quite addressable people who like are still in a world of managing fleets of servers, people who don't use Amazon or Azure or anything like that? Uh, so yes, our target market is quite specific. Uh, we are now or focused on enterprise uh, solutions. That's why we're trying to sell to big software development companies or even uh, software company having more than 1000 servers to manage. As our product uh, works with all kinds of servers, so uh, there can be cloud servers or uh, physical servers. So uh, we can be also, uh, we can target also smaller companies to medium companies. Um, could somebody who uses, uh, say, Amazon or uh, Google Cloud or anything, would they still be customers or would their own hosting tools be enough? Uh, they also can be our customers because on our platform, you can regroup different servers from different providers. So uh, you will manage it from, from one place. Cool. And also for your developers, it will be easier because they won't need to to have a lot of settings, a lot of different password keys, cool. and so on. How, how does a company solve this today? Is it truly as you described that they end up with like emails, chains back and forth with credentials or is there any solution for this at the moment? Well, uh, actually every company has his own, uh, its own solution, but uh, a lot of companies are still uh, having these passwords in emails and docs and Google Sheets or for example, they are sharing with um, even unknown people, with freelancers or with remote workers, uh, which do not are, are not belonging to the company's employees. So yes, sense. this problem yeah. exists. When larger companies are considering uh, buying Werbot, uh, I assume they're they're in some sense they're now uh, adding you to their security posture. So. Uh, has that put like extra compliance regulations on you? Do you need to be like SOC 2 compliant or anything like that? Yes, of course. Uh, and uh, we are prepared for this because we understand that uh, these data are very sensitive. So um, as for security, all the data are encrypted. From, and for enterprise solution, we are, uh, we are planning to work with the HSM. So... Um, it's like um, to, to increase the security of the data if in, in case of the hacks. For sure. Uh, and la last question is, how do you intend to attract customers? Uh, now we are, we are attracting customers from direct sales for, to our enterprise version. And as we have a SaaS version, so we have a website, we have some promo, we do some mailing campaigns and so on. Cool, excellent. Cool. I have no more questions. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Next up, Des, your final pioneer today uh, is, and also our final uh, pioneer in our lineup here, is the team from there. Uh, and they are Mo and Ben presenting from Iran, Estonia, presenting there. Hello. Perfect. Now, Des, are you in Ireland? I am, yes. So great. We have now a connection from Ireland to Iran through the magic of Zoom and the internet. Awesome. Right. Take it away, guys. Hey, great to be, super happy to be presenting to you, Des. We are building there, which is presence for remote teams. This is the app you're building. Your teammates, your list of teammates in your menu bar, but it's not static. You can interact with it and see their current status. Let's get back to the status later, but focus on how you can talk to them. You see that red button? When you press that, you can talk to your teammates and they get a little notification, which is interactive at the top of their... Uh, system and by pressing a key they can talk to you and after you're done ask the question clarity on a document you can close it no awkward moment to join uh, to end and no uh, passing links to join let's show you a quick demo for example you're working on a document with a teammate let's see how you would talk to your teammate here you would click the red button talk and then Immediately when they reply, you're in real time talking to each other. And it's so low key and frictionless, you don't feel it's there, but it's there and it's like sitting together. And then you close it when you're done with it. 
the problem you're solving arises even when the, the very first person is out of the office. Collaboration and communication become the biggest struggle. And in an office, we can talk, but without one, we only talk in meetings and default to text. And text is slow for quick collaboration, as we all know. Enter office of the future, ambient presence, frictionless talking, which is the core of successful communication and collaborative screen share when you are not working in Figma, Notion, Google Docs, because in those you have multiplayer. In our screen share, we give you cursors you can type just like for helping with the code or solving a bug. But there's more. We have lots of little things to help you broaden the bandwidth of your communication. For example, a status done right. You can, uh, you can reply and applause your teammates' status updates. You have an office door which you can close to stay silent, to really get into the zone. And a quick nudge, which is a very light touch way to just grab attention of a teammate, but not so uh, like a Slack notification which demands their full attention. Our team is three person, all technical. We are launching in four weeks and our previous app is used by thousands in most respected distributed teams across the world. And our app is available today for downloading the beta. That's it, thank you. This is, re <clears throat> this is really cool. I'm, I think about workplace communication quite a bit. So I'm, I was uh, excited to see this. I kind of, there's loads of different questions I wanna ask, but. Generally, right. what type of what type of communication will this capture? So, so on the, a scale the, on a scale of like project updates through to hey, let's go for coffee or whatever. Yeah, by providing you with a set of different methods to communicate, you can range from hey, let's resolve this bug, let me show you this bug, to let's review this document together, to hey, I'm bored, I'm just uh, nudging you if you're also bored. If not, that's totally okay. And if you don't want to proactively talk to a, a person, you can just post a status update and people who are same as you in the app can watch them react, reply, and then you're connected, bringing that serendipity you lost in, when you left the office. I, I like the idea of this being a layer. I think um, like as in it exists independent of all tools. I think there's a lot of strength you get from that. Um, what I keep wondering is like, what's your like uh, thesis for like workplace communication? And when I think about this, I think uh, will in the future will do you think communication will be more async or more sync, more visual or more voice? That's more text. That's awesome. Searchable? Glad you asked. Glad you asked. You ask. Well, that's two questions. First, async via sync, and then text via voice. So we we actually have that in mind, and we believe communication works only if it's global. So, for example, if you talk in general where everyone can hear us. We keep the log of the communication and the next day when the teammate wakes up, they can play it through the story view at the top and then you can get back and reply. So you, you also have the logs for teammates who are not there. And we also match teammates in a public space to the, their local remote workers for, I don't know, grabbing coffee, having a free site chat, but that's the next step. And for the, so we are magically, you can both have async conversations and sync, but mainly it, the real quick collaboration happens when you both are, uh, when you have one hour overlap, we want to make the best out of it. Mm -hmm. So, just like uh, for, yeah, and for the text via voice. So in the next, you can always have transcription, blah, blah, blah. But what we believe in, we are not replacing a Slack, although your Slack might become a bit more empty. But if, the, uh, if we can make voice so powerful and the bandwidth super higher, you prefer it for quick collaboration and reserve text for announcements, for um, longer decision-making periods. You use Notion, Slack, Twist, Threads. You keep all those tools, we're not replacing them. But when you want to really, how many times you get text? Like, let's quickly resolve this on a call. Uh, can you, you give me a Zoom link? We are perfect for that, for those moments too. Do you think you'll have to recreate a lot of Slack over time? Would you have to add channels and groups and all that sort of stuff or? No, for uh, having the rooms, we also have something in the lined up, which is uh, ephemeral rooms. It's just like in an office where you pick a desk at some place and someone can join you. We're not going to recreate a Slack, specifically that's the goal. And be, that's the reason we built the app this way. So it goes along whatever set of tools you want, Zoom, Slack, Threads, whatever. 
That's awesome. Um, before I, I, I'm going to ask one more question. I do want to say, I think you've designed a really, really uh, attractive and very cool looking product and you should be uh, like genuinely, it's, it's, uh, it's actually, quite- Des, I really love your uh, product taste. I've seen you, your videos on YouTube. So that's, that really means a lot for us to hear that from you. Thank cool. you. Well, well, well c- c- congrats. Um, it does seem to me like the, the anchoring idea here is the idea of a task bar app. Uh, and I think, and I, I really do think there's something, there's something in that, in that like it's, it's a minimal app. Um, do you anti- like, do you anticipate staying there? Will you have to go to mobile? Will you have to go to iPad, desktop, etc.? We'll go to mobile for because you you might fear you miss something. We want to have that option for people because people work in a variety of different remote work situations, especially if you we are looking at industrial rem- workers like who are on the site in different uh, around the city. They would love to have an iPhone app further along the road, but uh, as having a bigger desktop app. Uh, only you do that if you have something really meaningful, for example, an office floor or something, but not uh, just for sake of having. It. Cool, cool. Uh, this will be a super quick one. Sorry to the pioneer guys. Uh, what makes this a work tool, do you think? Sorry? What do you what mean? What makes this a tool for work versus a tool for that? You, would you use this to talk to your friends too? Uh, we've seen uh, communities really quickly adopt the tool to post their status updates and bond together. But this is mainly built for the workplace tools. But let's say, uh, what app do we have for workplace that isn't being used by mm-hmm. consumers in fun ways? If yeah, we are did, successful, I think both yeah. will benefit. Yes, I, I agree. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for your answers. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you there, team. Thank you, uh, Pioneers. And thank you, Des. Hugely appreciate Des, that was incredible. Today. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you for the invite. All right. Well, while the audience, uh, while you get your votes in, we have a few special features coming up. First is Dylan Field, the CEO and founder of uh, Figma, and he will be retro pitching uh, Figma to Daniel as if sort of back in the 2013, 2012 stage. Just bring him up on stage. He's just walking over. (laughs) Dylan. (laughs) Hey, how's it going? Hey, Dylan. How are you? Good. Good to see you, Daniel. Good. Uh, now I hear you have a special treat for us. Uh, I saw you um, actually have not just the oratory that you used uh, to pitch Figma, but indeed the pixels that followed with it. Is that right? I have a lot of pixels for you. So uh, the sort of framing of this before I jump in is that... And by the way, thank uh, you so much for doing this and fantastic haircut and beard. I see you've inverted the hair um, set up. <laughs> uh, that makes sense. I, I was thinking I might shave you for, uh, before coming on, but I didn't have enough time. Please. Uh, no, 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 no. Be ragged and raw. Makes us all a bit more lazy, but thank you for having me in. And uh, really cool to see all the pitches before this. Um, awesome. Well, I'll share my screen. The uh, sort of context here is that Figma was very different in 2012, 2013. And we did not quite figure out where we're going to be uh, going maybe until, you know, more like 2014. And so you'll see some like of the, the, the uh, trail that was leading to what Figma is today. But you also see a lot of things that are very different. Um, I'm giddy with excitement sure. for this. So please take it away. Awesome. So yeah, my name is Dylan and uh, this is Figma. Uh, so my, I'm on the left here. Uh, this is uh, me, I'm a Teal Fellow and uh, recently dropped out of Brown. Uh, before that, I was at Flipboard twice actually and did an internship as well at LinkedIn and uh, was a research assistant at Microsoft Research. Uh, Evan Wallace on the right is my co-founder and he was my TA at Brown. He was also at Pixar and Microsoft Office as well. Uh, we we're really inspired by Brett Victor's talk, Inventing on Principle. And this is a talk that uh, I think everyone should watch. It's one of the most impressive technical talks I've ever seen. But one of the things that Brett Victor said in this talk that I thought was, uh, it really resonated with me was that if people cannot create, uh, and that's a moral wrong, and that our tools should make it so simple enough so that everyone can be creative. And when I thought back to my work as a designer at Flipboard, uh, I, I just remembered how much, how fresher I was with my tools. Um, you know, primarily I was working in fireworks, uh, but honestly, the tools were not very intuitive and they were not very collaborative. They were very hard to use and very hard to find information with as well. Um, and so Evan and I started talking about what we could, what could we do with WebGL? And this is actually a demo Evan made a few years back and it's of a ball in a pool of water. And so I can move it around. I can even press G and the ball will drop and rise to the surface again. And you can see that this is all, uh, in the browser in real time. And it's all made with WebGL, which means that you can use the GPU in your computer to have this real-time uh, graphics in the browser. And we thought, okay, if we can do this in WebGL, like we could probably also look at building basically the entire creative suite in WebGL as well. Uh, and so I think there's sort of three aspects if you think about what it means for creative tools to go online that are really important. 
Uh, the first is access. The second is building community and a network. And the third is education. So on access, I think it's really important that these tools are free if you're working in public. Uh, and also that they're really intuitive as well. Um, I think that the, uh, on the connected side, you know, how can we make a GitHub for creatives? How can we make it so that you can be able to get collaboration, have collaboration and give feedback on work? And also how do you make a global community around design? For example, when I tried to find this globe graphic on the left-hand side here, uh, it actually took like an hour to find it. And why can't I just go online and actually be able to find that and use that as long as I attribute back to the creator? Um, you know, I don't think that honestly, uh, you know, in 2013, I don't think that um, real-time simultaneous editing, that's probably not gonna be a thing, but I do think that people wanna give uh, feedback and that's something that people really need. Uh, the third thing here, this third pillar is education. Uh, how can you make it so there's recipes and also an opportunity for people to connect uh, via this network and mentor each, other, mentor each other so we can make it so that more people are creative in the world. Um, so that I'll show you some of the work that we've done already. Uh, this is all really rough and it's very, it's a bit divergent from where we're at now today, but I wanna show you what's possible in the browser. Uh, this is all things we've explored and you know, really now we're more focused on graphic design. So this first one is one of the first experiments we did, uh, which is basically a way to do Poisson bundling on the CPU. And it shows that you can do this in the browser even with web, but without WebGL, but it's not quite as fast. Um, I'll show you the WebGL version, so it's a little, just a little bit faster. So for example, if I press run here and I move this, you can see that the plane is sort of blending as it goes in the sky. Or if I run this, you can see this eye is uh, you know, going into uh, the skin there. Um, you know, one version of this that we made as well, and I have to just move the zoom UI, uh, is uh, this face swapping application. We made this back in maybe August, September of 2012 uh, as one of our first things that we built. So. Um, for example, if I take Patrick's photo here, I can cut out uh, this region of his face, and then I can take Daniel's photo, and I can drag Patrick oh over this. Oh my god! Uh, and now I can actually not save for the, work. Avert I can change eyes. the mask. Did you do this to, to the investors you were pitching live? Not always. They didn't always have a good response to that. <laughs> <laughs> we figured that out pretty fast. I kind of like actually saved off a little bit of eyebrow there. So this worst experience I've had since people made fun of me in high school. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's great. It's great. Back those feelings. It's my dream. This is my dream. I always wanted to look like this. Exactly. Oh my God. Take, I'm taking. There's also something like kind of looks like Matt McInnes, I think. Um. Anyway, the uh, this is um, it's actually a bit broken now. It's bit rotted, but basically you could do selection. So if I draw white on what I want and black what I don't want it would have selected the flower back in the day, but now it's actually a bit broken. Um, another version of that is uh, image matting, which basically you draw white on what you definitely want, black on what you definitely don't want, and gray on the in-between pixels. Uh, and this way you can extract a foreground from the background. So if I press run here, you can actually see uh, sort of this alpha extraction as well. And same thing for this girl taking a photograph. Uh, if I press run, it'll go through that and get a pretty good mask. Um, you know, this is another experiment we did, which was around color lines. So basically the idea was to take a photo and then from there you could uh, extract sort of out here are the different colors in that photo and they actually you could see the gradients visualized in space. So for example, if I take this blanket right here and I wanna shift that color line, uh, you can see that this is basically creating a mask of that blanket and then shifting that in the image. Um, we took that one step further and kind of combine that tech by taking uh, this graph cut approach and then from there saying, okay, what if we could make it so that you define the mask? And then from there, you're also able to change the hue. And the results were really cool. Uh, another one is the Firefox logo. So if I do this, and then I can actually change the gradient as well, which is pretty neat. Um, the, another thing we built, um, and I'm, I actually don't have the photos I used to demo with, but uh, here I'll, I found one from 2012 or 2011 of me. Um, this is a photo editor we built. and so. Uh, it's sort of like a Lightroom in the browser. You can very easily uh, crop. Um, you can also bump up exposure or take it down. Daniel, if, if you don't, don't, don't worry. You don't look that scary uh, compared yeah, to this. Uh, I can take the shadows up. I can this take the highlights a down. Live uh, shot of you after your all hands. Exactly. This is right after all hands. Um, the uh, <laughs> hopefully not. Um, <laughs> you can also, uh, I can go and I can also. Uh, change the tint as well by doing sort of, um, you know, correcting the white balance. Um, I can also go in here and I can, you know, change red eye, for example, 
really easily. Now, did you have all this stuff as part of your pitch? We did, yeah. I actually yeah. have the videos from the 2013 pitch originally, uh, and you know, it's, it's you pretty just fun walk to see. in and say like, I've basically built Photoshop with, uh, or Illustrator with a bunch of independent kind of hacks. Well, we didn't really have anything that was Illustrator at that point. Um, we had done a lot of photo editing and computational photography stuff, but the thing is, that we did it all in. Uh, it was all sort of um, individual projects. Right. It wasn't stitched together yet. And that was really, I think, in retrospect, one of the things that was hard. Um, another thing that's kind of fun here is just we built like a cloning tool. So if I take this uh, hot air balloon here and I maybe make a new hot air balloon, things like that. Um, this actually didn't really go with it at all, but we had built this, uh, this basically brush tool so you could get the color palettes uh, of a photo. And then I can, from there, I could like get the brush out. In order to make that, that animation was a bit cheesy, but it was a, it was a fun concept at least. Um, so yeah, so then sort of after showing the demo off, we would talk about, okay, here's where we're going next. You know, this is August, sorry, this is uh, June, 2013. And so of course, six months from now, we're gonna go ship this thing. Um, we're gonna have a closed beta. And I think what was really interesting at that time was that we were focused on really having the community uh, be the first part of the product that was out there. We thought we'd go for this freemium model, we'd launch the community, and from there, uh, we'd follow up with an enterprise SaaS thing. Um, and eventually, of course, we inverted that. And it wasn't until last October 2019 that we actually launched the community. Um, you know, spring 2014, you know, only uh, six months later, we're going to be launching our tablet version, uh, which unfortunately is still not out, although the community around Figma is starting to build that, which is cool. Um, I think that we were also really focused on just like, how do we make it so this is more accessible to everyone? So let's see at the very top is the professional uh, it has a lot of ability, a lot of money, but for people that are hobbyists and prosumers, how to make it so that they can use Figma as well as sort of this general purpose creative tool. Um, and then uh, the competitive landscape side, uh, I, I will release the videos uh, that are from 2013, the next few weeks of the original pitch. And one of the things that I famously say that uh, I was a bit, um, I'm a bit of ashamed of now is that I said, oh yeah, Sketch, you know, they're, they're very buggy. I don't think that they're going to be a long-term competitor here. So clearly that was <laughs> the wrong call. Uh, but, and then we thought that we would be hiring quite fast and that would just be very easy. In reality, it took quite a long time to hire and also reach these milestones. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the pitch. I will stop sharing and, and I can take some questions if that's useful. Oh God, that's incredible. Um, I think uh, that's incredible. Um, so I guess one question that's top of mind is you obviously, yeah, I mean, you come in you, with a real tour de force of JavaScript, right? So, um, I mean, to me, this seems incredibly awesome and exciting, but obviously um, you, you may have gotten rejected early on. When people said no, what, what were those reasons and the rationale? Well, I think you know, there's all sorts of reasons people say no, but in retrospect, the ones that matter are the ones that end up like people being people that I really respected later. So mm -hmm. for example, one of the people that I later became like a key force in Figma was John Lilly. He led our Series A round, uh, but he passed in the seed. And um, you know, sort of the reason he gave at the time was, Look, I just don't think you know what you're doing yet. And in retrospect, he was completely right. Uh, you know, he he um, he said, "Look, if you want to grab coffee once in a while, we can do that, and hopefully, it can be helpful. I can introduce to people. Maybe we'll figure this strategy out together. But I just I just can't do this right now. I don't think you're quite there yet." And then as we started to talk more, he was really helpful with strategy. We really figured out, okay, here's how we narrow our focus. We go into interface design. There's a big opportunity there. We focus on the collaboration elements. You know, actually, multiplayer is important. Uh, you know, we're going to go do a bunch of this stuff and, um, and eventually then he let the series a, uh, but, but yeah, I think that other reasons, I mean, I think people didn't just totally didn't get it, but then there's also people that did like Daniel Reimer at index, uh, who we both know, um, you know, I showed him the seed pitch that I just showed you probably a bit better because at the time I was more practiced and, uh, you know, he called me that night and said, I'm in. So, it, you know, there's people that also, I think had incredible vision and, uh, probably saw it in a way that I even didn't see, I did not even see it yet and had that thesis. Super interesting. Another thing that I, I really loved about your pitch is it is very um, uh, mission driven, not really market driven. Um, and I'm kind of curious to get your thoughts on that. Like, would that be your advice to people seed pitching today? Or do you wish in hindsight you would have gone in with the like, here's the TAM and here are the buyers? Yeah. Um, well, I think that, it, you know, I think it's really important that. Uh, you know, eventually you have to get there, but at the same time, I think that it's okay to not have to start there. 
Um, and it's more important that you go build things that are interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, in retrospect, if we hadn't gone through this journey of building all these other things, you know, one of the things that we didn't even show off was a meme generator, right? Mm-hmm. That was like the worst week of Figma was when we built a meme generator because it was, you know, Evan and I looked at each other and we went, wow, what are we doing? This has like no meaning or purpose. And like, we feel like we're completely afloat and like, why did I drop out for this? <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, I think in retrospect, like that was defining for us because it showed us that here are the things that we do want to work on. And then also because, you know, Evan is amazing. He built uh, the text rendering for that meme generator uh, as like this really well-engineered solution that we later were able to use in Figma. Uh, the actual product. And so I think by building and kind of exploring, you end up in places you might not expect if you just go with this traditional top down, like the Mad Libs of Entrepreneurship approach, where you say, okay, you know, what problem am I solving? Who am I solving it for? Why, why are they going to choose me over the competition? Um, you know, how much are they going to pay me? And then, like, if you multiply those things together, it equals this huge market, right? And it's like you can ask all those questions, and they're good questions to ask, you know, what's the problem? Why am I better? What's the competition, et cetera. Um, but if fundamentally you're not building something that's actually in the future, uh, you know, then why are you there and, and is it going to be defensible at all? Yeah, super interesting. And, um, yeah, I'm somewhat struck by, um, there's a, there's a great episode of Ali G I think where he goes to pitch ice cream gloves and he defines the TAM as the Google query results for ice cream times like Google query results of gloves times people that have hands or something. Um, (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Which, which is a bastardization of that concept. But I guess one thing I am wondering is. The, so the beautiful thing about Figma, in my mind, is that it's a great story of a labor of love turning into a great company. Um, but there's a lot of labor of loves that just st- get stuck in the labor of love thing. Um, and so maybe going McKinsey on this to the extreme is a bad idea. But do you have any other advice for people that are in the desert and aren't quite sure what their orientation should be? Well, I think it's, um, you know, starting a company is such an existential process in the first place. And... I think, uh, you know, if you're in the desert and you're building things that you like, hopefully you can uh, take a step back and say, okay, you know, life isn't so bad. Like I'm actually building things that are interesting to me um, and have the perspective that even if you were building something that was working, uh, it might not be something that you like. And uh, to keep going and building things that actually you enjoy and you're passionate about, because if you don't do that, then, you know, why are you, why are you there in the first place? Um, There's a million things to build in the world, but uh, not many that you'll find personally interesting or you'll be passionate about. So focus on your passions and, and keep going in that direction. And even if it doesn't work out, um, I'm sure it'll lead you to something, something interesting. Uh, but hopefully it will. And uh, there's a big community like Pioneer uh, support you. And so you're not alone either. Well, that's, we're going to be hard pressed to find better words to end on. Dylan, Dylan thank you so much. This is absolutely incredible. Um, uh, I guess, um, I've one, I do, I do have one final question for you. Yeah. If you weren't working on Figma today, what's kind of an interesting space and take us out of the whole Adobe suite. So if you weren't working on that stuff today, what would you be working on? Uh, the two areas that I think are, are most interesting right now, um, are privacy and fertility. Interesting and ominous. All right. We'll leave it at that. Um, I can talk Fields. more another time. But. Yeah, yeah, totally. We'll, we, we can go in depth later. Thank you again. Um, Thanks for having me. Uh, I think hopefully, uh, hopefully there's hundreds, maybe thousands of people watching this that um, that got the sense today that uh, everything big starts small. It starts with a bunch of, uh, I mean, I, I thought that whole thing was pretty awesome actually, but uh, with a bunch of HTML pages. Thanks, Daniel. Um, thank you again. All right, Jackson. Thank you, Dylan. All right, our final uh, special feature of this event is going to be a conversation between Daniel and Sam Teller. Sam is the uh, former chief of staff, uh, Elon Musk's former chief of staff, and he's graciously given us some time to, to chat about that with Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Jackson. How are you, Sam? I see, I see you have a lot of vegetation around you. You seem to be in a healthy environment. I'm in Canada, beautiful country. Um, I forgot to wear my, uh, my Nike gear. I see that most of this day was sponsored by Nike. So. Terrible, yeah. Yeah. Um, apologies for that, but look, we're just waiting for our, our SpaceX jackets, but, um, yeah, uh, go to spacex.com slash shop. <laughs> you don't need to wait any longer. Uh, that's great. They're quite expensive. It'd be great to get it. I, I think we've priced them like relatively affordably. I feel um, like it's the cost of a small Falcon nine rocket at this point, but that's my personal opinion. Um, yeah. um, such thing as a small Falcon nine. Well, One size fits all. Yeah. Um, to, um, Starship. 
No, but it's it, on the SpaceX apparel. We do get a lot of, including Kanye. Um, SpaceX uh, has had a number of like yeah. unbelievably talented people reach out saying, "Hey, you guys need to up your game um, and design cooler, design cooler stuff." Um, so I think I think there'll be some interesting new releases. Include and we had a lot of asks for, um, or SpaceX had a lot of asks for us uh, spacesuits. People want their own spacesuits after this week. Now that you mention it, I think I need one too. Um, <laughs> Is, is that the final chapter in the master plan? You know, there's the one for Tesla that ends with, a, you know, building a super cheap car. Is the ending of the SpaceX plan just building a new gap? A new, exactly. It's actually just like to, so to open the first pizzeria on Mars. That's the plan. That's great. Um, that's great. So, okay. Super interesting. At a high level, um, although... Uh, you know, a few people know it, I think you've probably led the most interesting life of the last decade uh, or one of um, uh, having um, really been around uh, our, our modern day Henry Ford. Um, and now, of course, you've transitioned out. Um, I guess at a high level, you know, I don't know if you got a chance to watch some of the stuff we were just doing with Dylan, but um, there's something I think very interesting about the fact that a lot of people view Elon today almost as inhuman, uh, as an alien, actually, maybe from Mars, uh, because of his achievements. Uh, and yet you hung around him and I assume you realize, you know, that he is somewhat human and that, you know, just like Figma, everything big starts small. So I'd be curious to hear from you, what are kind of some stories of early SpaceX, early Tesla days that illustrate that point? Yeah. Well, I was, I was only around from 2014 to 2019. So, you know, the early stories, um, I, I don't have as much firsthand experience with. And, and I think if you haven't read the Ashley Vance book, um, it's, wor it's worth a read. Um, you know, and there are the stories about Elon flying to Russia and, um, you know, trying to buy engines himself. And a lot of, I think, like good examples that translate, um, you know, for people creating companies of any kind. I mean, the things that I, um, you know, there, there are a lot of characteristics, I think, that anyone can see from the outside uh, that make Elon successful and um, his uh, energy, uh, his genius, his raw intelligence. Um, I think the, his clarity of vision and of mission and that and how that allows him to recruit some of the best people in the world um, and retain them, you know, when people at Tesla uh, have a hard day, um, like what's, what stops them from, you know, going across the street to Apple, Facebook, Google, and just saying, hey, I'm going to get a little raise and some free soft shell crab for lunch and, you know, uh, do this. It's, it's not that there's anything wrong with, you know, working at those companies, but um, the, the, the mission and the purpose is... Uh, arguably the best retention and recruiting tool of all. Um, I think some of the, like what you don't see and what's like less evident from the outside um, are things that uh, is like the, the, the degree to which having a high tolerance for pain uh, has made him successful from the very beginning and continues to, to this day. And um, I think, you know, if you look back to 2018, for instance, when Tesla was going through, you know, it's famous production hell, these stories about Elon being on the floor, working on things himself, sleeping in the factory, these were not like, you know, PR stunts or, you know, kind of manufactured anecdotes because I was right there living it too. Um, this, was, this was real life. And Elon certainly believes in taking the pain that you're asking other others to take. And part of what makes him successful is that he's just willing to take so much of it. And so when uh, you know, that for him meant doing things himself. That means, in, you know, learning how to install glass or install a seal on the car glass or turning the wrench or, you know, being on a line. And when we would, you know, at one or two or 3 a.m., when we'd be exhausted, Elon would say, you guys go into the conference room and sleep on the couch there. I'm going to sleep on the floor under my desk. And there were no, there, there were no journalists there. There was no one to ever see that. Um, there were four people in the world who, could you know tell you that story, but he would get on the floor of the factory with the bright lights, put a pillow under his head, but maybe sometimes another pillow over his head to block out the light and sleep on the floor while we were at least had some like you know a couch and some soundproofing from the room. So there's I, I think that um, you know it, there's another example from that period. His birthday is at the end of June. And his friends and family wanted to, you know, to celebrate with him down in LA, but the paint shop was down. And so what do we do? He suited up, 
in you know in a in a big white suit and uh marched into that paint shop which is pretty cavernous and uh you know and and not you know a lot a lot of light no natural light uh lots of you know paint smells and um went station by station to try and you know accelerate the throughput uh, of that part of the factory and while we waited for something to you know to for some software to be updated or for a new test to happen would we'll just sit on the floor there and do emails and whatever and this was on his this was you know this was on his birthday um celebration was 10 minutes you know, we had some cookies in the conference room like <laughs> in, in the back so so you know this is um i, th I think the, these are the things that are um you know and i apologize for rambling on a long answer to a short question but i think that when um you know you think about what makes him su successful it's not that you know, he, he's this, he's this CEO who can just wave a magic wand because he's Elon and then, you know, and, and things happen for sure that there is some of that. And there are things that Elon can do being who he is and in the position he's in that other, you know, that if you're just starting a company, you can't without a doubt, but also a lot of it, the majority of it comes down to, you know, taking the pain and doing the chores himself. And, you know, you know, at the end of the day, the buck stops with him. And that's, that, that was time after time, after time, remarkably, um, reflected in his actions. Mm. Well, I mean, what, tell us a little bit more about like, uh, in, in those moments of, um, you know, at the 20, uh, 20 second mile of the marathon, what is he like? I mean, is, is he frustrated? Is he angry? Is he happy? Is he making jokes? Yeah. I mean, I, th I, th I think it's all of those things. And I think what an amazing thing about Elon and that part of the reason why, um, you know, people love following him on Twitter is his authenticity and part of that is you know kind of transparency and vulnerability um and so you know if he's upset he's going to be upset if he if something's funny he's going to uh, you know he's going to laugh about it and he's going to share it and he's just you know he uh there's not like one you know i think like any person i don't know maybe not like any person but it you know there's not one mode that he gets into um uh, in those ways. He is, uh, he is a person who cares very deeply about what he's doing. And so to the extent, you know, you hear about, you know, extreme reactions or the way he deals with these things is because his, his care and, you know, his desire to succeed is extreme. Um, so yeah, I'd say it's a mix of, you know, what, what you said. What, um, what does a day in his life look like? Um, Elon, people don't, people, another thing people don't realize, Elon spends the most of his day doing internal meetings on engineering and production. Um, I think there's this, people say, you know, he, you know, he, he, that's not to say he's not flying all around, but he's flying all around to go to the Tesla factory in Reno, to go to the SpaceX test site in, 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 in Texas, to, you know, the Tesla factory in Shanghai, to, you know, to he's 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 not going around to you know meet with presidents and investors and you know and and things like that. Um, and to the extent he is, you know, because obviously it's not he never does that. But it's it's a very small percentage of his time. So yeah, Elon, Elon's first and foremost he's an engineer and he's a designer. Um, and so and that's reflected. I would say um, you know ninety percent of, of what he's doing on any given day, whether it's at SpaceX, Tesla, Neuralink, or the Boring Company is focused on design engineering or manufacturing and um like it, when does his day start is he kind of a morning person a nighttime person um i won't i won't comment on his his specific rhythms but i it's need to say he, he, he it's it's all the times and he um uh you, you know it's 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 a huge advantage for anyone to not need much sleep and he certainly benefits from that mm. um what um what what do you feel like you know we, we you talked a lot about you know his ability to kind of endure um w you know over the, over the timeline of that you were with elon what were the kind of uh, how would you say the hardest moments the moments where where you feel like he was the, har the hardest moments yeah yeah over the course of the year like what were the uh, hottest hells so to speak oh man um yeah uh i mean it's hard to pick just one. Um, there, there were um, Tesla faced a number of existential challenges, and I think the one, the one that I mentioned um, in 2018 
uh, as we were ramping up production of Model 3 is probably the best documented. Um, but you know, we there were there were major challenges in the scale up of Model X. Uh, that was that was the first time that I experienced this. You know, sleeping in the factory, um, not certainly not Elon's first time doing so. Um, there, I mean, one of the worst feelings in the world, and one that like actually makes me sick to remember, but is uh, witnessing a rocket failure, mm. um, which uh, unfortunately happened uh, twice. You know, during during my time at SpaceX, um, you know, it's like it's like getting punched in the stomach, you know, um, by Zeus or something. You know, it's uh, it. Um, so, yeah, there, I mean, there, there were a number of challenges, but, what, you know, what people forget and what all of you, you know, anyone who started a company knows is that every, you know, every day is just problems and challenges. And it's just, you know, if you're if you're creating it, you're you're just there to wake up and, you know, get get punched in a different way every day. Um, and sometimes it'll knock the wind out of you. Sometimes it'll, you know, just leave a scratch. So, you know, it, it all kind of, kind of blends together and it's, you know, having this, this resilience and energy and um, ability to, you know, withstand the pain during those tough times is uh, essential. How would you, I mean, one way of kind of noticing, obviously that Elon has a skill is being in the factory with them at three o'clock in the morning. How, how would you test uh, or think about knowing, you know, if you're thinking of hiring or maybe investing in people, do you, how would you get a spidey sense that they might have this resilience factor that you're talking about? Um, I think I think you ask people for examples of things that they've done, um, and you ask them for what in any aspect of their life, what is like evidence of exceptional ability, mm. and so that doesn't need to be in running a company. That could be. Um, in, uh, you know, in extracurriculars in school in the way that you want to um, formula SAE competition. It could be from uh, playing sports. It could play, be from uh, military service. It could be from caring for uh, a family member. It could be if you worked as a janitor that you found a smarter way to, um, you know, sort paper towels in, in, in the closet. Um, so, uh, just, you know, really um, asking for specific examples, uh, you know, that demonstrate exceptional ability, I think is one thing. Um, but uh, yeah, it, 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 it's hard. You kind of have to have that spidey sense when you're, when you're, when you're looking for it. And those people that feel like uh, you, we want, you know, now as an investor and, you know, throughout my time, you know, investing in companies, you want to invest in those people who feel like, you know, they'd rather die than let their company die. Um, and you know, you can, you can, you can, you can feel that. And, you know, when someone has that combined with, you know, vision and purpose, mm. you know, it leads you to see how really smart people want to come work for them. Mm -hmm. And that is really the essential thing. So it's, you know, do all these things combine to form, you know, a person that really smart people would want to go work for. That's very interesting. One, th one thing we were chatting a little bit with Dylan about with Figma is the degree to which one is very market driven versus kind of very vision driven. Um, and I'm curious to get your, your take kind of working with Elon. And um, how much of the conversation with him is about like, we need to do this because it's good for revenue versus we need to do this because it's good for the world. Very little about the former, um, you know, uh, but I, 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 you don't have that privilege necessary when you're necessarily when you're a when you're a tiny company. Yeah. So, I, you know. But um, at this point, you know, Elon is, and I believe SpaceX and Tesla are fundamentally trying to maximize usefulness to humanity. Um, super interesting. Um, so, so very much a different question. I mean, you've spent time on like a ton of frontier markets. Um, um, probably the two largest frontier markets, maybe alternative energy and space uh, that we'll see in, in our lifetime. What's, what's, a, what's something new that's exciting to you now? <laughs> um, there's so much. Well, it's funny because I spent, I spent the last five years or since 2014 to 2019 kind of with these blinders on. So if it didn't have to do with SpaceX or Tesla or boring come here Neuralink, it like, it just didn't exist in my world. And so um, now it's a very new approach where anything can be interesting. Um, so, uh, I mean, there are a couple things. One, you know, it reminds me, you know, Elon, when I started working for him in, 
it, one of the first talks he did in 2014, I think after I started was at MIT and this happened a number of times over the years, but someone, you know, someone said, oh, you know, Mr. Musk, uh, you know, if you're a young person today, what problems, you know, should you work on? And he said, tunnels. And everyone, ha, 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 you know, and he's, and he's like, no, 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 I'm serious, tunnels. <laughs> and, and this happened like many times until 2017 when I think, when Elon said, okay, no, one, <laughs> I, I, I just have to, I just have to do it myself. Um, so I still would say uh, tunnels and infrastructure, um, mm -hmm. there's a massive opportunity. And, and if there are any engineers out there who are interested in working at the boring company, um, I definitely encourage you to look. Um, the company is growing really quickly and there are some amazing high impact engineering opportunities there, especially for um, electrical engineers right now. Um, putting all that aside, um, there are so many interesting areas right now. I agree with the ones that Dylan said, I caught the end of his thing. One thing that's, you know, this is kind of a weird one uh, to give you some food for thought, but that's, that's pretty interesting to me right now is actually the death care industry, which no one wants to talk about for, you know, obvious reasons, but there are, um, there are, there, are, there are some really interesting um, death care. I think there are interesting opportunities there. And I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, so if, if there's anyone out there who is no starting doubt. a company um, in this space, you know, I, I'd love, I'd love to talk to you. It, it's interesting. There's, there's a lot of aspects to it, which are terrible from a consumer experience and that um, the process, for instance, of buying a casket, if you are going that path is actually not so different than what it's like to buy a mattress um, and kind of like <laughs> that led to, led, to, led to the inspiration right. for Casper, where you go in, there's no price transparency. They say, you know, if, you know, our, our standard uh, casket here will cost you $800, yes. but if you okay. really care about your grandmother and don't want her eyeballs to be eaten by worms, you will upgrade to our ultra premium casket. Um, and there's, you know, and they pull out a sheet of paper, which says, look, this is the lowest price I can give you. Um, and, uh, you know, so from, from, from that, there's um, so software powering the- Caskets, smart caskets. <laughs> More caskets, we need caskets. Anyway, software powering the industry is really fragmented. Um, there's a really interesting company called freewill.com out there, which does exactly um, what it sounds like. It allows you to make a will for free and they make money because nonprofits pay them to uh, be suggested as a recipient of uh, money upon your death. Um, so anyway, I think, I think, I think it's for obvious reasons, people don't want to think about this area. So um, I think that there's opportunity there and uh, an opportunity to make like a, make people's lives uh, less terrible during a time of, uh, you know, pain. Well, um, so, uh, that was a morbidly interesting suggestion. Um, uh, uh, certainly uh, an unexpected answer. Sam, thank you so much. Uh, I think this is awesome. I think people love hearing. I think, I think the idea, the concept that um, perseverance is the key to success is, uh, is a fantastic one because I feel like that's something everyone can access. Um, you. you know, it's not about where you're from, the country you're in. It's not, it may even be uh, less about intellect and more just about the ability to push through. Um, so, so that's beautiful. Thank you so much. Enjoy Canada. I will. Great uh, to see you, Daniel. Take care. Thank you again. All right. Um, now, um, I have the um, honor and responsibility um, to, um, to do two things, really. One is tell you a little bit about um, who won uh, uh, the, uh, uh, our leaderboard uh, in terms of uh, presentation voting. And the other is to wish happy birthday to two um, of my colleagues here at Pioneer who had their birthday last weekend, one day after the next. Um, they refused to show up uh, for, for this particular event in the presentation. I don't know why, um, but uh, I brought them here in their digital format. So, so Rishi and Jackson just wanted to say, um, working with you is awesome, super energizing, and everyone watching this should very much appreciate the work of these two individuals, not uh, not really me. Um, as you can tell, they're also better looking and better dressed. Uh, they're unfortunately not sponsored by Nike. So that's it, something I have for myself. Anyway, all of that being said, um, all of you have been voting around and uh, uh, expending uh, your precious internet points um, on, on our different presenters today. And so I wanna just share with you who won, um, who got the most votes. Uh, in third place, uh, we have Live Docs, the kind of next generation Google Docs Quip um, product. Uh, second place, we have Rant, 
uh, disappearing audio messages, kind of a, an asynchronous clubhouse, so to speak. And in first place, hailing from Iran, we have there um, building a sense of presence for remote teams. That's pretty exciting. Um, hopefully the content today was enjoyable for you guys. Look, I realize the internet is you know, more certainly more varied, but Zoom isn't as engaging as the real world. And so we tried to keep it chipper and exciting for you. And hopefully, I, I mean, I really found the conversation with um, Dylan and um, Sam energizing. Hopefully you did too. Um, Pioneer is something that is available to exactly 100% of people that have access to the internet. It is uh, free. So you can go to the website and uh, kind of get started. If you have a project that you're going to check out, you should certainly give it a go. There's literally nothing to lose. I mean, you could get started with a pseudonym. No one will see you in your nakedness, so to speak. Uh, and if you totally fail, no one will know. If you succeed, one day you'll be up here on this live stream. And if you really succeed, well, you'll come back to the live stream and do us a favor, just like Dylan did. Anyway, thank you again to my colleagues. Um, thank you again to uh, everyone who is watching. Keep us posted if you have any feedback. Um, you can email us, team at pioneer.app. And uh, with that, I'm going to leave it to you to the next time we meet on the internet. Thank you, everyone.